Welcome everyone. We are now in the ninth week uh, of London Business School's Willard Institute for Business and Development open access uh, lecture series on African history through the lens of economics. Uh, it seems like yesterday that we started this journey using the tools of economists, but also taking an interdisciplinary approach to understand some deep, uh, uh, the deep origins of contemporary African economic, social and political development. Today's sessions will focus on the role of private, mostly European companies during the colonial era, the role of so-called concessionary companies that we briefly touched upon in earlier uh, sessions. Uh, we are extremely privileged and honored to have uh, uh, two great speakers uh, who have done and are doing a very important work on this much underexplored area, which nonetheless has been a defining a uh, feature of European colonization in Africa. Let me introduce uh, our three panelists. Let me start with our own uh, Amanda Maria uh, Umuze, who is currently a student at the London Business School uh, doing the one year master's program, master's in management. Uh, Amanda is a graduate of the Lagos Business School in Nigeria, and she joined the LBS after doing some work uh, in consulting, in banking. Uh, now Maria, uh, Amanda, uh, is also the Laidlaw uh, Scholar at the London Business School, uh, and uh, Amanda will collect the questions as in the previous sessions. Please start sending us questions. Amanda will try to put them together and, you know, pose them to Sarah and Giorgio. Now, Sarah Lowe's uh, is assistant professor of economics at the University of California at San Diego. Uh, she graduated in economics from Harvard University. Uh, she worked for a couple of years at Bocconi uh, in Milan. Uh, then she did a postdoc at Stanford University. And then she joined uh, the, U, uh, the University of California in San Diego. Uh, Sarah uh, has done very interesting and exciting work uh, on historical African development, among many others. Uh, she has uh, a very fascinating paper connecting what happened during the colonial times and some interventions of the French uh, colonial administration on medicine and the impacts uh, that has uh, nowadays, which is very topical given the, the pandemic that sadly is not over yet. Uh, Sarah has also worked with Nathan on issues related to kinship, to aid sets, so she has very also interesting work that we briefly covered uh, when Nathan discussed cultural issues in lecture two and lecture three. Today, Sarah will discuss her very exciting work uh, with Eduardo Montero. It started when they were both uh, PhD students at Harvard, trying to examine a very sad and unfortunate and notorious uh, epoch uh, of uh, colonial rule. Uh, associated with the rule of King Leopold II in the infamous Congo Free State rule. So Sarah, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Giorgio Cavelli. Uh, Giorgio uh, currently is an assistant professor at the University of Montevideo in Uruguay. He graduated from Bologna University, so both of our uh, speakers have, you know, some uh, uh, have done their service, I guess, in Italy. Uh, and then he joined London Business School, where for four years he was a research fellow uh, at the economic subject area of London Business School. Uh, Giorgio has done also some very exciting work uh, uh, on historical African development, but also uh, work outside uh, Africa on trade agreements, uh, uh, among others. Uh, he has a very exciting work uh, with Chicho Amodio on the transition uh, in South Africa uh, during uh, uh, 1994. So Giorgio will discuss some ongoing work uh, that him, uh, Stelios, Etienne, and, uh, and I have on uh, trying to expand uh, the work that Sarah had started and many others. So without any uh, uh, more delay, let me shut up. Sarah, the floor is to you. Thanks again for being with us. Please start sending us questions that Amanda will try to collect. Thank you all. Thank you, Elias, for that introduction. Um, I just want to make sure my slides are visible. So let me just they are. share those. They are. Perfect. Thank all right. Uh, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for the opportunity to share this work with you guys today and also for organizing such a cool course. Um, it's a really exciting um, idea. Okay. So the project I'll be presenting today is joint work with Eduardo Montero. Uh, the project is called Concessions, Violence and Indirect Rule, Evidence from the Congo Free State. So um, as Elias was saying, um, what we were interested in this project was exploring the effects of private concession companies. Um, and the context we were interested in is the Congo Free State, which is the present day Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
And we first sort of read about this in the context of Adam Hochschild's work um, in this book called King Leopold's Ghost, where he documents sort of what these concession companies were like and some of the horrific sort of effects of these different companies. Um, so the map on this, on this uh, screen is a 1904 map of all the concessions that had been granted in Congo at that time. So these are concessions to private companies that have basically monopoly rights over extraction of resources in these areas. And so you can see that sort of a lot of Congo by 1904 had been allocated to these private companies. And sort of what Hochschild writes in his book is that the world has managed to forget one of the great mass killings of recent history. It was unmistakably clear that the Congo of a century ago had indeed seen a death toll of Holocaust dimensions. So sort of staggering negative impacts of these companies is sort of what he's writing about in that book. And so we were interested then in trying to understand what exactly happened um, and what are the long run effects of these concessions. And so a couple of things to keep in mind is, you know, what's really great about this setup is that I'll be talking really in depth about what happened in the Congo Free State, and then we're going to get more information on concessions across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But at least for the Congo Free State, um, these private concessions that were granted to these companies were basically characterized by a couple of key factors. So the first is that they were able to use extreme violence um, to force people to work for them and to extract the natural resources uh, within the concession boundaries. And then a second sort of characterizing feature of uh, these concessions is that they would often co-opt and coerce local leaders um, into supporting their regime. Um, and so we're gonna call this indirect rule. And so we're just gonna keep this in mind when we're trying to understand what are the long run effects of these concessions that they were really characterized by extreme violence and by the co-option of these local leaders. Okay. So while we'll be focusing, like I was saying, on the Congo Free State era, and then, you know, um, what present day Democratic Republic of Congo, um, concessions were actually granted by all major colonial powers. So the British, the French, the Belgians, Germans and Portuguese, like everyone was granting these types of concessions. And sort of if we're trying to understand why that might have been the case, it's likely due to this idea that they needed to show some sort of effective occupation of the areas that they had negotiated over controlling. Um, and then in order to actually occupy those areas, they didn't have capacity and so would often then sort of co op these local leaders into helping them show presence in these areas. Um, and so, you know, Mozambique had many different concessions. Um, as Rhodesia, the entire country was a concession. The Republic of Go lies um, allocated to different private companies. Yeah, so we can go through a lot of different examples, but in specifically in this paper, you know, the effects in the Congo Free State, this was a super common system about which uh, we know relatively little. Um, and so part of the reason that it's been a struggle to study these um, concessions is partially like just mapping all of them is really hard, but then we're also, you know, interested in trying to identify causal effects of these concessions. And so in order to do that, we're going to focus on some of the concessions that were granted in Northern Congo, because the way the boundaries were allocated has some nice features from the perspective of trying to understand and identify causal effects. So the boundaries of the concessions in the Northern Congo Free State uh, were defined using salient geographic features. In this case, um, the extent of river basins plus the 25 kilometer buffer. And so what's nice is we can think of that as being sort of quasi random or uncorrelated with other features that may affect long run development. Um, and so the other interesting feature of the concessions in Northern Congo is that they existed for a relatively short amount of time. So about 14 years for these specific companies. And so, what we're going to try to do then is focus on these concessions in Northern Congo, which are called Abir and Anversois concessions, and try to understand how exposure to these concessions may have affected long run development um, in these areas. Okay. So we're going to try to answer uh, three different questions by studying the Congo Free State and these concessions in the Northern Congo Free State. The first is, is exposure to this form of economic production, so this colonial concession system, important for understanding relative underdevelopment of parts of sub-Saharan Africa? 
We're going to find evidence that indeed it is important for understanding development that places that were arbitrarily just inside these concession companies relative to places that were arbitrarily just outside of these concession boundaries um, have lower levels of education, wealth, and health, um, even today, um, over 100 years after these concessions ended. Um, we'll also then ask, uh, did these concessions lead to less accountable leaders? And so this is particularly because of what we understand from the history that these concession companies would co-opt local leaders and coerce them into supporting um, sort of the extraction and their regime. And we hypothesize that this may have led, had long lasting negative effects on local institutions. And so what we'll find is that indeed sort of inside these former concession areas, uh, village chiefs are more likely to be hereditary and less likely to be elected. And they're also providing fewer public goods. And so we'll consider that as sort of proxies for institutional quality. And then finally, we'll ask, how did these colonial concessions shape social norms? And we'll collect data um, on levels of cohesion, levels of trust, and levels of support for redistribution. And we'll find that sort of interestingly, it seems that these concessions may have actually created more pro-social norms. And so later on in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about how sort of the effects on institutions, um, the negative effects on institutions may have led to sort of a response in terms of more pro-social norms. Okay, um, so we're going to try to contribute to a couple of different literatures. So um, some interest in trying to understand how uh, concessions like the ones that are, were in Congo affect present day development and on which we'll hear more after, uh, after my presentation. Um, some trying to provide evidence on the consequences of indirect rule. So what happens when you sort of change the scope of power of local leaders? And then finally, um, contribute to work on how violence may actually increase uh, pro-social behavior. Okay, so King Leopold um, II acquired Congo Free State as his personal colony in 1885. Um, he was supposed to, and sort of based on his negotiations with other Euro European powers, he had promised to maintain the Congo Free State as a free trade zone that would be open to everyone who could then come and trade. Um, and for a while, it did operate as this uh, free trade zone. But at some point, he basically decides that he's going to declare himself the owner of all uninhabited lands, which obviously people were living there. Um, and then he divides then the Congo Free State into different parcels, some of which go to these private concession companies, and some of which um, were allocated to himself as part of a crown domain. That was basically his private kind of concession company. Okay, and so we're interested in the two concessions that he granted in the Northern Congo. Uh, these are called Abir and Anversoise. And these are basically the largest um, concessions that were granted in the North. And they focused almost primarily, uh, or almost exclusively on the extraction of rubber. And then importantly for um, sort of trying to understand the long run effects of these concessions, uh, the boundaries were established using salient geographic features, so the extent of river basins, and we can think of this as sort of um, quasi exogenous variation and sort of why people were exposed to these concessions. Okay, so here's a map of Abir and Anversois concessions. You can see um, that the concession boundaries seem to align more or less with the extent of river basins, which is going to be important for trying to estimate the causal effects of these concessions. So let me tell you a little bit about how these concessions were run. So they were interested in collecting natural rubber. Um, they would force people to collect rubber on behalf of the company as a form of what they called paying taxes. Um, the Congo Free State granted these companies with uh, police powers and rights of detention. Um, they were also, the companies were also given support from the forced public soldiers to basically coerce people into the collection of rubber. In addition, the companies would maintain their own militias. Um, they would arm these militias with um, guns. Um, so they would be the only people in the area who would have these types of weapons. Um, and so the labor system basically was set up in this following way. The company would establish posts within the concession boundaries. Uh, one to two European agents would be assigned to each post. And then they would have armed uh, post and village sentries that would be stationed both within the posts 
and within the surrounding villages. And then these sentries would be tasked with making sure people met their rubber quotas. Um, so the second sort of salient characteristic of these uh, concessions was this idea that local chiefs were either co-opted and coerced into supporting the regime, or they would be replaced by people who would be willing to be compliant. Um, and so sort of our research and our reading um, of ethnographic um, data suggests that sort of this co-option led to a loss of authority and prestige of these individuals who had formerly run these villages. Um, and the head sentry, so the sentry who was in charge of each particular village um, was referred to as the capita and he would often sort of take on um, the responsibilities that had traditionally been um, filled by the lineage headmen and by the previous sort of um, local authorities. Um, and so these capitas would take on the responsibilities of the chief, um, such as resolving disputes, and this led to sort of a degradation of this previous uh, leadership role. So the other salient characteristic of these concessions was the sort of intense violence that was perpetrated uh, within these concessions. So these post centuries and village centuries, in addition to the European agents, would use extreme violence to make people meet the rubber uh, quotas. So they would rule through fear and intimidation and individuals would be uh, severely punished if they didn't meet what were really um, intense quotas. So for example, people could be imprisoned, uh, members of their family could be taken hostage, um, village chiefs were imprisoned, uh, people could be deported to other labor camps and then they could be exposed to physical violence such as whipping and burning or death. Um, and so when we think about sort of what this period may have been sort of what, what the results of this period may have been, you know, what's highlighted in some of the historical work on the area is that this led to immense social stress. Um, it amended, demanded forms of social adaptation and sort of new ways of cooperating within society. So local institutions were really severely undermined uh, by these concession companies. Uh, people were facing extreme violence, they were facing famine. Um, and so one thing that's highlighted is sort of how um, these groups adapted socially and one sort of adaptation or one adaptation is this idea of age sets. So these strong horizontal ties between um, local men may have been one sort of coping mechanism that allows people to ensure each other against sort of the extreme sort of bad outcomes that they're facing. And this would allow them also to bypass sort of the more corrupt local leaders that had been co-opted by these concession companies. Okay, so in 1904, um, uh, a group of people get sent to investigate sort of all of the um, atrocities that were happening in the Congo Free State. This led to um, basically Abir and Anver Swaz leaving the Congo Free State in 1906, though sort of this also happened to coincide with the fact that they basically nearly exhausted the natural rubber supplies by this time as well. Um, by 1908, the Congo Free State um, is turned over to uh, the Belgians, so it's no longer King Leopold's personal colony, it's now a Belgian colony. And then sort of rubber production was no longer really relevant um, because there was competitive production of rubber, not, not the type of rubber that was grown in Congo, but um, rubber through tree, tree plantations um, after 1910. So what we're going to be interested then in is trying to understand first if there are negative long run effects on development outcomes. And to do that, uh, to test whether or not that's the case, we're going to take data from the demographic and health surveys for Congo. And then we're going to take our digitized boundaries of our two concessions of interest, Abir and Amber Swaz. And then we'll ask, do places that happen to be just inside these boundaries relative to places that happen to be just outside of these boundaries have worse development outcomes today? So these, this is a map showing the boundaries of our concessions of interest as well as data that we have from these DHS surveys. Um, so the little dots represent different villages that um, were interviewed during these DHS surveys. And we'll basically ask is, if we compare places that are just outside these boundaries relative to places that are just inside, uh, do we see worse outcomes inside these boundaries? Um, so the first set of outcomes that we're going to look at are going to be education. Um, so here are the results for education. So in short, what we find is that if you're inside um, a former concession, you have 
basically 1.8 fewer years of education on average relative to those places just outside. So this is actually a fairly large effect size. Um, we can also um, look at um, wealth as an outcome. So the DHS collects a lot of different information on assets, and then they construct an index um, that's taking into account all the different types of things people might own, like bicycles, cars, TVs, whatever. Um, and what we'll find is that, again, being inside one of these former concessions, being relative to being just outside one of these former concessions, um, you are less wealthy on this wealth index score. And then finally, um, we also look at some health outcomes. Um, so the DHS collects some nice data on um, height for age, which can be a really good proxy for access to nutrition, particularly for children. And we'll find that um, both female respondents to the DHS survey, as well as their children, are an average shorter inside of these concessions for their age. Um, so this is sort of a good proxy for um, sort of access to nutrition as a child in particular. And it suggests on average that these places are worse off also in terms of health outcomes. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of different uh, robustness tests to show that these results really seem to be identifying the actual effect of exposure to these concessions. Um, so one interesting exercise we do is say, okay, um, you know, these concessions ended over 100 years ago. Like, why or should we still expect to see effects? And one thing we do is just show that, you know, surprisingly, perhaps these effects seem to be really persistent. So if we look by birth cohort at the effect of being inside these concessions relative to just outside, you can see that for each birth cohort, so those born in 1950, those born in 1980, those born in 1990, you see this negative effect on education, this negative effect on wealth, et cetera. So one way to think about that is that you might expect to see convergence over time, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And, and because there isn't convergence, then we're asked, okay, you know, want to answer the question of why isn't there convergence? What may be explaining this lack of convergence? Um, and so we do some work trying to understand the intermediate era because of course these concessions ended a long time ago and a lot has happened since then. And we don't find any evidence, for example, of differential missionary presence over time, uh, nor do we find evidence of differential colonial investment. And the reason this is important is because, you know, perhaps the missionaries, if they were responding to the concession era, they may have tried to compensate or likewise colonial investments may have been less in these former concession areas because they wanted to avoid them. There's lots of potential stories, but in short, uh, we don't find any evidence of these differential investments by either missionaries or the colonial regime. Um, which led us then to try to understand the channels through which um, these effects might persist and our focus then on understanding how local institutions may have been affected and how um, pro-social norms may have been affected. And this is also linking back to when we think about what really characterized these concessions in Northern Congo. So the extreme violence um, and the co-option of local leaders, that's sort of what helped um, narrow down what we were thinking about in terms of channels. Okay, so in order to examine channels, um, we went to a city that happens to be located right on the border of one of these former concession boundaries. So the city is called Gemena. It's on the border of the former Anversoise concession. And sort of interestingly, from our perspective, Gemena was created after the end of the Congo Free State era, so in the mid-1920s. And so it, it basically consists of people who've migrated to that city. Um, and so we happen to have some people whose ancestors come from just inside the concession, and also people whose ancestors happen to come from just outside the concession. And what that allows us to do is to sample um, people within the city of Gemena, ask questions about how their villages of origin look, so what are institutions like in their village of origin, and also have some survey questions trying to measure uh, pro-social preferences. So we collect data with about 520 people um, in the city of Gemena. So Gemena is the bright red dot, and then the other red dots uh, represent the villages of origin of the people in our sample. And you can see about half come from inside uh, the Anversois concession and about half come from outside the Anversois concession. Um, so the first set of outcomes we look at is institutionally, sort of what are the effects on um, the accountability of local leaders. 
And this is motivated by the fact that historically these local leaders were co-opted and replaced by people who were willing to cooperate with these, um, with these rubber um, concessions. And so we're interested then in um, what do local chiefs, how are local chiefs selected and do local chiefs provide public goods? Um, and what we find is that when you compare sort of villages of origin just inside the concessions relative to villages of origin just outside, that chiefs are much, much less likely to have been elected inside the former concessions. And we tend to think that sort of elected individuals should be more accountable and more responsive um, to the needs of their constituents. Um, and then, so what that means is if they're not elected in this setting, that means they're often hereditary. And sort of an interesting thing is that around the time of these concessions, there was the establishment of different types of hereditary lineages um, in these areas. And so it's possible that that's sort of what's persisted over time. Um, we also find that chiefs inside these concessions provide fewer public goods. And this is across a wide range of public goods that you might care about, like maintaining schools, maintaining roads, et cetera. Um, this is just an example of a road and you can see how like you might need some maintenance or things aren't going to go well if you're trying to drive trucks or motorbikes through this road, particularly during the rainy season. Um, the second set of outcomes that we look at are uh, differences in social norms. And this is sort of due to the fact that one of those key characteristics of these concessions was the extreme amount of violence that they were able to use uh, within these concessions. And there's this really interesting literature suggesting that exposure to violence may actually increase prosociality. Um, and so for these reasons, we collect data on trust, how much you trust others, how close you feel to them. Um, we also collect measures of altruism through um, a lab experiment, so a dictator game, and then respect for property rights and sort of pressure for redistribution um, type questions and also a, a, another lab experiment. Um, and so in short, what we find is that there seems to be evidence of greater prosociality within these former concessions. Uh, people are on average uh, report being more trusting. They report feeling closer to a wide variety of others, both sort of in-group members, so people from the same time, but also out-group members. Um, we find that they also believe that it's really important to redistribute uh, your wealth towards others who are in need, and likewise that others will expect the same of you. So there's this sense of, um, sort of it being important to um, serve as a form of insurance for other members of your community. Um, and then finally, um, we don't find any differences in our experimental measure of altruism. So no differences in the amount of money shared in a dictator game, but we do find sort of more willingness to redistribute um, in another sort of lab experiment. So again, consistent with this idea of the importance of um, informal insurance. And so in short, you know, these um, concessions were characterized by extreme violence. Uh, Non-compliant chiefs were co-opted and replaced and individuals were forced to rely on other members of their community in order to survive. And today we find that this seems to be associated with worse development outcomes inside these former concessions um, with chiefs who are more likely to be hereditary, less likely to be elected, who also provide fewer public goods. And then, you know, more pro-social behavior and stronger sharing norms. Um, and sort of one of the limitations of our study is we can't distinguish between a couple of different stories. So we can't tell you if these rubber concessions led to worse institutions and those institutions then led to more pro-social norms. So if you undermine institutional quality, maybe you get this response in terms of pro-social norms, or if these rubber concessions both directly affected institutions and directly affected pro-social norms. That's not something we're able to disentangle. But it does seem, at least from the historical narrative um, and ethnographic evidence, that there may have been a feedback between sort of undermining institutional quality, leading to this need um, and response in terms of more pro-social norms. Um, and then finally, sort of at the last part of our paper, we ask, you know, let's take the boundaries of all of these concessions we have for Congo and ask if we even just look at sort of the correlation between being inside any former concession, even if it wasn't our two of interest of Beer and Empress was, do you see these negative persistent effects on development? And indeed, you know, across all of those different measures or proxies for development that we were interested in, being inside any sort of concession um, in the Congo Free State is associated with worse, worse present day outcomes in terms of education, wealth, and health. Or, yeah. Okay. 
So in conclusion, um, in our paper, we're trying to understand the long run consequences of this very popular um, sort of form of economic production. So this colonial concession system. In our setting, these are characterized by extreme violence and the co-option of local leaders. And we combine sort of survey and experimental data to show that these concessions seem to have long run negative persistent effects on development and seem to have affected institutional quality and pro-social norms. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Let me share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much um, for the amazing presentation, Sarah. Um, and thank you, let me let me join your praise to Elias Stelios, uh, Leonard and Nathan for organizing uh, this amazing public good, which is actually the course that we are all attending. And I'm actually delighted to be able to participate and contribute. So the short presentation I will be giving you today is based on an ongoing and preliminary project, which is trying to do uh, one thing, which is charting the existence and uh, activities and, pra in, uh, and practices of all the main colonial concessions that have been operating during the colonial period in Africa. This is a joint work with uh, many familiar faces for those of you who took the course. So we have Etienne Lersignol, uh, Stelos Michalopoulos, and Elias Papayon. So before I jump into the core of the presentation, let me make two acknowledgements here. The first is that on behalf of the team, I would like to thank the European Research Council and the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development for generously funding our research. And the second remark is that this project is truly an effort uh, of teamwork. And above and beyond the four economies that you see listed here, we have a team which has been composed by economists, historians, policy scientists, and cultural anthropologists working on four continents, Europe, North America, South America, and Africa, and many countries in these continents that have been basically uh, performing tasks which were fundamental for, for the success of the process. So I unfortunately don't have time to list all of them, but this is the slide in which we acknowledge their amazing work and this project could not be there without their, their, their great work. So now let me try to start my presentation by motivating uh, the topics of colonial concession through the lenses of the concepts that have been taught in the last weeks during the course. So by now you should know that colonization is what we call in economics a bundle treatment. So bundle because it is composed by different uh, elements. And one of these elements is clearly the organization of the colonial state in terms of institution, investment, and markets. Now, we know that mm, a direct practice uh, that has been adopted for organizing the state was a direct rule in which imperial powers were basically setting institutions uh, for mm, basically administering directly the lives and economic activities in the controlled territory. On the other hand, we have uh, what is being called the indirect rule, which is basically a way of organizing power in which the imperial uh, powers were using, um, molding and, uh, and, and affecting the existing the pre-existing form of power structure that were present on the territory that they were colonizing. So this is the interaction with local chiefs, the local authorities and kings. But there was a third way. And this third way was the outsourcing of colonial practices through private concession companies. So we have just witnessed a super eloquent presentation by Sarah describing what has been the experience in Northern Congo free states, uh, but many, many places in the, in, the, in the continent has witnessed this kind of, uh, uh, of um, colonial um, concession companies activities. So for the case in the case of Zamb in Zimbabwe and Zambia, where the British South African company was present, we have examples in Liberia where Firestone was actually set in place, 
and then also Mozambique uh, with the Niasa company and the Mozambique company. These are just examples of this outsourcing of colonization through uh, private entities. Now, what is a colonial concession company? So let me try to define it. There are many definitions, one of which is basically clearly related to the fact that these were in private enterprises or private firms, which had a concession. What is a concession? Well, a concession is basically a formal legal agreement by which land is temporarily demarcated for specific uses. So you can see already that this definition has two dimensions. The one is a de jure one. I mean, this is truly the provision of a contract that assign a piece of land to, uh, from the colonizers to the private entity on which then the private firms will operate and perform their investments, its investments, operation function. But there is also a de facto component of this, of this definition, because clearly social and economic activities, and in some cases, even boundaries, did not coincide with the provision of the contract that were actually agreed upon, right? Because it was very difficult to enforce this kind of contract uh, on the ground, and like colonizers were acting in many cases, this private company didn't have an understanding or knowledge about the territories that they were basically set in a bond. So when did it all start? Let's say when these uh, outsourcing practices really boomed. This coincides with the uh, Berlin Conference of 1884 with, and, and the subsequent conferences thereafter, which basically established the so-called scramble for Africa, the phenomenon under which Africa was partitioned across and among the different uh, imperial powers. This is not uh, meant to imply that private colonial companies were not present before uh, the, the Berlin Congress in the African continent, actually they were present. And in some instances they were present even before the formation of modern European states. But clearly the search in the number of these outsourcing practices started uh, with this doctrine that Sarah also mentioned, which was the effective occupation doctrine came, coming out from the, from the Scramble for Africa conference. So this was the need for these colonial powers to consolidate their presence on the assigned territories. And why did these imperial powers rely on this strategy of colonization? Well, clearly the states were running limited financial resources and many of the territories that were assigned were actually larger in size than many countries in Europe, okay? And the economic rationale for, for the adoption of this practice, it's twofold. So from the perspective of the imperial power, this would have facilitated the uh, extraction of resources. And at the same time, there was an intent of maximizing revenues for this colonial state without entailing the uh, corresponding investments. So there was also like minimizing the cost of, of colonization. And from the perspective of the firms, clearly there was uh, uh, the idea of maximizing the profit of the investment that were performed on this, uh, on this concession. And in most instances, as Sarah, as Sarah showed, this corresponded to brutal practices of minimizing the cost of labor through coercive labor and co-opting of labor chairs, of local chairs. Now, the first takeaway I want you to take uh, away from this, uh, from this presentation is the following. So this strategy of colonization is a widespread phenomenon that characterized the full colonization period in Africa. All imperial powers has used this form of colonization. So the British Empire did, France, Belgium, Germany, and Portugal, and as well Italy, which is not in the list, but it should. Now, what do we know about the investors that were behind this kind, this kind of outsourcing. Well, many of these are notorious and famous and controversial historical period, uh, historical figures like Cecil Rhodes, for example, on the British South African uh, company. But also we have other people like Rothschild and actually I had to admit I didn't know before starting this process, this, this project also the Lever brothers, which are the founder of the Unilever Corporation, actually started their operation uh, through the Royal uh, Company, uh, Niger Company, and the United Africa Company. So actually, this is uh, an interesting fact. 
Now, as soon as you understand the relevance of this, of this phenomenon, many questions arise, right? So what is the impact of this process of colonization on the ground, both in terms of local and the economic wide uh, aspects? What are the legacies uh, in terms of how this uh, phenomenon has changed the economy, quality and culture of the population that were affected by this outsourcing of colonization? And many other factors, like we would like to understand whether uh, there is some level of heterogeneity, given the sizable variation that we will observe later when I will show you the data, uh, in the practices that were used by the concessions, like extraction, violence, forced labor, authoritarianism, investments, economic activities, and operation. Okay. Now, the approach of our of our, of our project, or if you want the ambition of our project, is try to move beyond case study, given the heterogeneity that we know it exists on the ground, it exists on the ground, and move somehow beyond the local effect to measure externalities and economic wide implication and interconnection of this corporation. Another very important thing that we would like to do is to trace the evolution of colonial concession companies over time. Because I mean, if we really want to unbundle a treatment, we also need to unbundle the time dimension that is uh, effectively inside the stream. But in order to do that, we would need a detailed and granular mapping of colonial activities of this concession, business investment and institution. So what we try to do with this project is basically filling this kind of gap and collecting the most comprehensive uh, um, evidence that we could on what this colonial um, of this colonial concession company were doing on the ground. So as I said already, this project is in nature multidisciplinary. We have interacted a lot with people from other fields in social sciences, and we learn a lot about the kind of data that we were using, what uh, and, other, and other insights. And for this project, we also took up an African approach, right? Given the fact that many colonizers and many companies were active in different countries, we took basically, we scaled up the project and tried to recollect, record, classify, and somehow providing some quantitative information for all the main concession firms in colonial Sub-Saharan Africa, with an exception, which is South Africa. So the working, uh, the, the, the work of the team has been basically to collect data from primary, secondary sources, as well as archival information, and then digitize this kind of data. So we had a country expert that was designated, his task was basically to understand what the concession throughout the period of colonization meant for each given country that we studied in terms of activities, practices, finance, and operation. We then visited more than 20 colonial archives in more than nine countries in Europe and in Africa. And there is this project, uh, there is this process, sorry, of ongoing digitization of roughly 1,500 concession companies that we derive information on the boundaries and other characteristics from more than 1,800 maps across 24 African countries. And then, of course, as I said, we're still using uh, the knowledge that we have in the team to validate the data that we have. Okay, so we are interacting with scholars, both in Africa and outside the continent, to check whether we can improve the information that we're getting from the colonial archives. And I'm willing to go back to this uh, to this to this uh, part later. Now, what are the outputs that we're going to provide with this with this project? So as I said, we're gonna provide a new geospatial data consisting of the location and the boundaries on which this uh, concession company were actually operating uh, together with the practices and operation. And the one feature that we will do with this, with this data set is that it will be public available. So you will be able to enter the website in which the data will be and download it for educational purposes or research purposes, okay? And then the aim, once this is ready, is to provide and shed light, as Sarah did for, for Congo, for the DRC, on the impact and legacies of this concession. Tangentially, another product that would be outside of this project is the availability of country report. So 
historians and country experts has basically standardized the knowledge of colonial concession throughout the period of colonization for each country. So to capture nuances and understanding a little bit the background, which is key if you want to perform some kind of analysis at this aggregated level, at the Pan-African level, you cannot lose the grasp of what is happening uh, on the country level experience. So just to give you an idea of what we're doing, and this is very similar to what Southern Eduardo has done, have done for, 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 for DRC, uh, this is just an example of the many maps that we have digitized. So this is a map of Liberia coming from the archives in, uh, colonial archives, of, archives in France. It depicts the situation on the ground of the colonial concession as well as infrastructure settlement as of 1938. Then our team has collected all this information and extracted different layers of data out of it. So you see here, you have basically the depiction on how these data were digitized. And Liberia, let me just uh, restate this very clearly, is just one of the 24 countries that right now we have, and we have more country count. Okay? So we will expect to have these at, for one period, for more than one period of colonization and many countries. Now, uh, before I jump to the presentation of the data, uh, let me make two other additional points, which I think are important here. The first is that, Another aspect to keep in mind when starting concession is that colonization in Africa lasted for quite some time. And I mean, the period that we're studying is pretty heterogeneous in its, in its, in its, um, in its nature. So we have, for example, and it's actually uh, one thing that we learned, that activities and practices of concession company, as well as their presence on the ground, varied across the different colonial periods. Now here is just the usual definition of the colonial period according to Goveri Vidrovic, a definition in which we have the early phase of military and administrative conquest. Then the second phase is the phase of economic exploitation or mise en valor. And the third phase is the pre-decolonization uh, phase that spanned from the end of the Second World War to 1960. Now, why I'm making this point? Because during these periods, many things that in terms of shocks, economic shocks, or even like phenomena and events, which are external to African development. So for example, just here I've listed some example, the first wave of globalization, which is actually the surge and soaring of commodity prices, which is linked to the second industrial revolution between 1870 and 1890, which has spiked the international demand for white rubber, cotton, palm oil, which are all products we were attracted by economic concession on the ground. But then there are other events which are happening, like Great Depression, for example. The global economy is basically on the downturn. There is a plummeting on commodity price and many bankruptcy, which involve also many economic concession. But at the same time, interestingly, there is, for example, an increase in the demand for gold, which led to an increase number of exploration and prospecting in French West Africa, where many new mining colonial concessions are going there in order to find what it was told to be uh, the French Transvaal, okay, to this idea of returning to the gold standard. And another example, and then actually uh, I'll pass to another point, is that phenomenon and event that were happening in the, in the, in the homeland of colonial concession, uh, of colonial power, sorry, like Portugal, affected the decision of what was happening on the ground in the colonized uh, part of Africa. So you have this policy of Novo style of uh, Salazar in Portugal in 1930, which wanted to achieve autarky. And this autarky was basically an autarky about cotton. And the consequences of this decision is basically that in Mozambique and in any part of the Portuguese uh, colonized Africa, many concessions are basically shifting their production to cotton. Like in, in um, and we are basically seeing uh, a deviation from, um, from native crops, okay? And then the other point, that I want to make is that the type and diversity of colonial concession on the ground is actually very sizable. As in the case of Congo, there are plantation, which involves the extraction of rubber, 
in any parts of Africa, there is a huge consumption, uh, huge exports of and production of palm oil. Sisal, which is like a fiber, which is before the event of plastic was used in several uh, industrial procedures and copper, as I said. But then we have mining, we have trading companies, forestry, and pure infrastructure. So if we have to categorize the type of colonial concession with some classification and some overlap, these are basically the main activities that are on the ground. So just here, a few examples to give you the, the span, the, the, the special span, we have Tanzania, Sudan, with plantation of sisal and cotton, mining happening in Namibia and Tanzania, diamond and, and, uh, and gold, trading ports, especially this is happening in the French West Africa, timber cutting and forestry, and, and, and these are basically the main, the main activities. Now, another important characteristics, another important dimension of the concession is the relationship that this, these companies were having with the administration, the imperial headquarters, their investor, and the community and the local population. So there are different degrees of variation across the, the, the colonial concession experience uh, in which we see that some concessions were more collaborative than others, equity stakes was involved, there were royalties, and somehow there was a variation in the ability uh, of taxing the population. Then the same applies, the same degrees of variation applies to the relationship with the chiefs and local elites. There were cases and instances in which uh, European firms were often working formally through wage or informally, so they were paying the local chiefs or informally uh, taxing, basically taking a cut of the production to, to buy out the local elites. And clearly, and we have seen this uh, before, the local the, the degrees of violence exerted towards the local communities varied, uh, even if it was quite substantial high, substantially high across the spans of the colonial concession throughout Africa. Now, let me jump to the presentation of the data. So let me show you what uh, we can say with our data set. So first of all, we have information as of today for 1,454 concession companies spanning across 24 sub-Saharan countries. And as I said at the beginning, we have several informations that like containing the life cycle. So when the company started and when it stopped, we know uh, information about the main economic activities what they were producing or extracting, when, uh, and we also know information on the market structure. We know ownership and financing, we know who the shareholders were, who the shareholders were, uh, the capitalization and the nationality of the sector. And then we also have several information on all these other variables, which I listed before, relating their relationship with the states, with local population, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of coverage, what we do have at the moment are the following green countries. So we have completed a collection of sectoral data, country reports, and code books for the majority of the part of West Africa, and then for the uh, basically part of East Africa and Southern Africa that goes from uh, North Sudan to Mozambique, to Namibia, and as well uh, Madagascar. There are other countries which are coming in the next weeks, which are the countries that were basically, uh, that were belonging to the French Equatorial Africa. Uh, and then we're also going to focus on Ethiopia, Nigeria, and, um, and Angola. Now, in this subset of data that we have, I can show you perhaps for the first time, the spatial distribution across country of the numerosity of colonial concession that were at least active in one of the period of colonization. So you see that there is sizable variation in the employment of this outsourcing practice of colonization through private means in Mozambique, uh, Ghana, DRC, Tanzania, and Ivory Coast. These were actually pretty extensive practices at the country level, less so in countries like Mali, Somalia, and, uh, and Amin. Now, this is clearly not the final level of aggregation at which we can present our data. We can do better. So in order to show the level of spatial and temporal disaggregation that we have on this data set, let me zoom in, allow me to zoom in to Liberia once again. Could have been another country, but it so happened to be Liberia for, for this presentation. So this is the situation on the ground 
in terms of colonial concession in Liberia in the second period between 1920 and 1944. So you see that we have two concessions. We jump then to the third period and we're able to see that now colonial concession are more present here in this period. So just to grasp a little bit the kind of dimensionality of data that we will have available to use in, in, in the next weeks. Another thing which is interesting to show is for, remember that for each of these polygons, we also have information uh, on activities and other characteristics. So we can perhaps show you something else, which is the distribution by main economic activities of these 400-ish, uh, sorry, 1,400-ish uh, companies on the ground. So you, as you can see, the majority of uh, this concession company, they were basically uh, um, producing uh, as a main activity, uh, activities related to mine, and you see it here, as well as basically plantation and agriculture, which is the second category. Now, these are non mutually exclusive category because many concession were actually doing more than one economic activities. And interestingly as well, there were a lot of action, well, it's a little bit less, but still some sizable action on prospecting and on trading, okay? Now, for each of these categories, for each of these sector of main activities, we can zoom in and check what are the main products that were produced in each of these sectoral categories. So for example, I'm just listing some pack in order, rubber, cotton, and sea salt, and sugar cane. Um, which are the most, uh, if, like the, 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 the kind of main product produced by each of these concessions, and mining is gold, copper, and diamond. Now, for the sake of time, just let me try to conclude. So as I said, this is an ongoing research that try basically a, to, to do one thing. So we would like, uh, Departing from the understanding that the experience of colonial concession company is common to many African nations, and that there is an important spatial and time variation in both the presence and intensity of these colonial activities, we offer and we would like to provide this new data set to start investigating from a pan-African perspective the impact of concession at this continental scale. This is the idea of opening the way to answer new, new and old questions with this data. Now, let me stop here with there are many things going on, but I just want to, to still 30 seconds. I know that I'm most likely out of time, but I just want to open a little bit of discussion on persistence. And I've seen uh, some question about this in the chat. Uh, we know, and the Sara and uh, Sara and Eduardo's work show that there is a long lasting effect of concession throughout different channels, right? There are institutional, cultural, and historical channels. Perhaps there is another channel which is still uh, understudied, which is from a standpoint of the academic uh, debate, perhaps a little bit boring, but it could be actually very subtle, which is the persistence of concession activities still on the ground today. So let me just conclude with this graph and I'll leave here and I'm ready to open the, the discussion, but this, our data allows us also to tell us what happened to the concession companies after independence. Clearly, there are many companies that disappeared before reaching independence, and there are many companies that are liquidated. But there are many concession companies across all the different countries that we have in the sample, which are still operational, either through nationalization, or they continue to operate as they were, or they are merged through other international ones. So I'm done. And thank you very much for the attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Georgia, for adding to our knowledge pool in this area. Um, it was extremely exciting to discover from Georgia the types of colonial concessions and the relationships between these and the local communities and the administration. Um, it was also really interesting to learn from Sarah the events that led or gave rise to the need for pro-social behavior alongside the sad developmental outcomes in the areas of education, wealth, and health. Um, so as we begin the Q&A in a few minutes, um, I'm just going to say a gentle reminder that due to the time constraint, we may not be able to answer all the questions in this session, but fear not, because I have word from the Weather Institute that all questions will be answered. 
and post it via their websites over the course of the week. So please do not be saddened if your question is not mentioned today. Um, it will be answered and posted. Okay, so um, we have a great question here from Lucia. And she says, is there evidence that the private concessions used different production or extraction techniques in the land compared to the techniques used previously in those concessions? So I think this really applies to the presentation that Sarah made. Um, so Sarah, if you'd like to take this question. Hey, um, okay, so the question is about production techniques, if I understand well. I mean, so I guess I'll answer for the concessions that I focus on and maybe Giorgio will be able to answer more broadly about the other concessions. Um, so Abir and Anversoise were exclusively focused on the production of rubber. And so what's sort of interesting about that setting was that yes, natural rubber existed. It existed in these vines and people might use it a little bit locally, but it wasn't really something that was being produced in the sense that it was really like super important to people's day-to-day -day, like use. It was really like the invention of the pneumatic tire so in other parts of the world where there was in this huge increase in demand for rubber, and then Congo happened to have this really huge natural resource endowment that was then sort of what became the focus of these um, concession companies. So in short, sort of what they were asking of people wasn't something that they were traditionally doing much of. Um, so collecting this rubber wasn't something that was really traditionally very important for their local production. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Jojo, would you like to add on? See anything? Sure, great question. So, I mean, we do observe that there is somehow a disruption uh, in terms of the kind of technology that was used for production in many traditional in many traditional uh, products and crops. Uh, this regards agriculture. Then, I mean, clearly, not only uh, this applied, but also there were like changes in the. Pro, the, in, in the products, right, that were produced. So for example, the, the example that I made about Mozambique. So there was like a cottonization of a country which have never grown at that scale cotton and the kind of uh, requirement that needed to be produced in terms of volume were way higher. So we do observe also through time in some concession and some settings that there was adoption of the newest available technology. And clearly, I mean, I would say that somehow the answer to this question is yes, on both margin the extensive and the intensive. Perfect, thank you so much for these valuable insights. Um, we have another question related to this theme from Boala and he says, what factors do you think really led to the rise of these colonial um, private concessions and companies? And this would be open to both Sarah and Georgia, please. Um, I can talk a bit about Congo and then Giorgio <laughs> has such a broad perspective with all of that work that they've done. Um, I mean, my sense was that for the Congo Free State, you know, King Leopold basically finagled his way into getting access to all of this land. And part of his like reasoning was promising these other European powers that he would allow for free trade, that he would stop the slave trade. And then, you know, in order to maintain control over the Congo Free State vis-a-vis -vis these other European powers, he basically had to signal some form of effective control of these territories. The Congo is huge. <laughs> and so like being able to do that is really hard without a lot of capacity and sort of in a context with limited capacity, these concessions are one way of trying to signal that you have control over this territory. So my sense is a lot of it is about control. And then the other part is like, how can he get as much money as possible out of this concession? Um, and so extracting all of this surplus through these private concession companies. Totally, I will just quote uh, Sarah's answer because I mean, this is also our understanding, not only to the DRC cases, but also to other countries. I mean, bear in mind that, I mean, yeah, these were colonial powers, uh, but the financial system that they were running at home was limited. I mean, many of these uh, colonial powers at the end uh, of the 1800 were broken. And I mean, I'm speaking about my homeland, Italy, uh, which basically was almost a failed state at the at the end of the at the end of the century. And many other countries, especially it uh, by 
by the Great Depression and subsequent and subsequent phases, I mean, they needed to find different ways to be on the ground. And as, as I highlighted and I highlighted in my presentation, I mean, this is really a, a, a maximization of uh, extracting of revenues strategy. I mean, you don't embark the cost, you just outsourcing, outsourcing to a private company that will do it for you. And you can raise capital on the, on the share market uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam, in London, and, and it has more resources to spend on the ground than what a normal state would do. That, that would be my answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, we also have another question from Miriam, and she was asking, um, was there any competition among companies for these concessions, or were there, were there just too few companies for there to be any meaningful competition? Um, Sarah, would you like to go for this one? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about, again, the case of Congo. And, you know, what's interesting about Abir and Anne is that actually they were basically owned by the same set of people. So competition wasn't super meaningful when it's the same group of people who are running the companies and benefiting from them. Um, but of course, Giorgio can speak maybe a bit more broadly to that. Sure, I mean, th th what Sarah said is exactly right. So uh, it's not that we see a lot of competition, many firms, I mean, or even in Europe, there were fewer capitalists that could do and could embark in such, such uh, such an endeavor, if you want to call it like this. Uh, we do see, though, a lot of dynamics in merger and acquisition of different firms. So like the, 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 the narrative that I gave you before about the Lever Brothers, right? So, I mean, they started with a company, then they acquire another one, uh, which was the United Africa Company. Then they also were operationally in, uh, in, uh, in uh, DRC. And I mean, this is another interesting fact, right? So we usually think about colonization with the colonial, colonial state identity, but on the ground, we see a lot of variation in the identity of the capital of these firms. So like you can find basically a UK uh, or a Great Britain, better said, uh, firms operating in Benchal Congo. You can find German company operating in Mozambique, which was a Portuguese company. So there is also this action which I think we still need to understand. And I mean, I think this is actually what this, I mean, this discussion in this course is about, right? Perhaps this is a, a, a fruitful avenue for further research that we hope you can contribute, so. Thank you so much, Georgia. Um, I like that you spoke on contributions. We'll be coming to that in a few minutes. Um, but just as you were speaking, um, there's a question actually around the implication and effect of this concession. But, but mainly on Africa's fight against um, gender education. Do you think you can give some insights on, on this particular area? So I, this is, a, oh, sorry, sorry, Sarah, go, go, sorry, apologies. Okay, I, I'll, I can respond. I also wrote in the chat and I think, um, I mean, my sense, my understanding of that question was whether we expect there to be sort of different effects across men and women in the long run persist like is there do women suffer disproportionately as a result i mean in my setting we didn't find any differential effects uh for example on the what education or wealth results by gender um but you know we didn't actually explore any of the proxies that the dhs has for women's empowerment and maybe we there might think that sort of because these places are less wealthy today, perhaps then there may also be some other negative effects for women, but that's not something we explored and I think would actually be really interesting. Thank you so much, Sarah. Georgia, please have a go. So let, let me just add totally. I mean, I don't have an answer to this question because I mean, I lack the uh, empirical evidence to answer it. I, I can just build on perhaps a few consideration on contribution on the literature and economics. So we do know that like gender norms and, 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 and educational achievement by gender are influenced by the kind of crops or economic activity that were basically uh, run on the country. So we know that for example, cotton uh, and, and tea leaves in China, this paper by Nancy Niang, uh, Nancy Kian, sorry, is basically telling you that there might be 
different specialization and different incentives to go to school. But I mean, as Sarah said, it's really like too early to say, given the evidence that we have. So, Thank you so much for that. Um, we also have a question around the tendering process. I know that Sarah already um, replied to this question in the chat, but I thought it was also very relevant. Um, so Sarah, if you could please speak on the tendering process by which these concessions were allocated. So at least for Congo, my, my sense is that basically you have wealthy, well-connected people. So people who you know are in inner circles with like Leopold II. So all of these types of people have the kind of money and capital you would need to make these types of investments are the ones who are likely to then get these really nice concessions. Um, so formally, what was the tendering process? I, I'm not exactly sure about that. Like how formally did these people go about getting access? Um, it seems a bit more informal to me. And at least in, in, in Congo, what happened is because the interior of the country hadn't been well explored, they're then allocating these huge tracts of lands based on the types of information they have, which in this case was river basins. So Congo has a lot of river basins. And then these boundaries were like, okay, you're gonna get this river basin or this river basin. Um, and as of that 1904 map that I showed at the beginning of my presentation, basically all of those concessions correspond with different, different river basins, um, some much larger than others. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, to Georgia, um, I'd like to pose this question that says, how do you think the findings from these studies can be used to develop um, institutions in modern times? Um, we do know that attitudinal changes require a lot of effort and time, but what, what other ways do you think we can leverage these findings? This is a big question. So uh, let me try, let me try perhaps to answer with a consideration and an additional question to it. So, uh, what we're seeing on the ground right now, right? So, I mean, there are other economic powers, if you want to play in the continent right now. And the final slide of my presentation as well is actually entailing the fact that we might have got them something wrong. I mean, some of these corporations and these firms might still be at play on the ground, right? So the question is, how do we change the situation? How do we say this setting? Perhaps the question that we should ask is, Okay, if these guys are still on the ground and additional firms are coming, right, to perform some kind of concession activities, what has changed? So do we observe striking changes compared to what were the economic practices? And I've seen there was a question there as well of what we could have said about Colton, right, in, uh, in, uh, in DRC. Well, I mean, I guess uh, Sara is better, is better suited to answer that question. But I guess that, I mean, with the idea of learning from the past, Perhaps we should also try to, to address this kind of point, right? So it's changing institution is super time consuming. I mean, as said by, 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 by authors in, in, in the economic literature, it might also be related to these narrow corridors and the interaction between society and institution. It's a very complex issue. So let me, let me just stop here and posing questions instead of answering. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so the final question for today, I can see so many questions coming into the chat, but sadly I'm looking at the time and we are sadly running out of time today. But like I said, not to worry. Um, the final question I'd like to pose to both Sarah and, and Georgia really is if there are any, like you mentioned, there are probably some colonial concessions in place still today. So do you think they have uh, directly or, or indirectly influenced Africa's land policies? Um, maybe Giorgio, do you wanna take a pass at, at that question? Sure, sure, I can do. Uh, well, I, I can, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm providing more doubts than certainty today. I mean, the only thing that I can say for certainty is that we still have plantations in the same places where the colonial plantation are. Now, we still have mines and mining activities in places where mining activities were. This is what I know and what we know right now. Now, on the effect that they still continue to exert, I mean, the answer might be yes, but we lack consistency and rigorous economic analysis or analysis 
on what the data tells us, right? So we know that in some case, I mean, we know for sure from other researchers that mining activities can be detrimental for the development of an economy. But then the question here is a little bit more complex. So you're asking whether the continuity, first of all, if any, uh, of the practices on the same colonial concession is affecting or is creating underdevelopment. The only thing that I can say, we hope to be able to look into this question. And if you're interested, please stay tuned. That's a perfect ending to this uh, Q&A. Thank you so much. I, I really do hope that this session today has ignited a spark in a few of our participants to want to do further research on these particular areas so we can add to our great body of knowledge. Um, but unfortunately, we have to close the session now. But before um, closing the Q&A, I'd just like to say that I've personally learned a lot from this um, session. And I know our very active um, participants have learned a lot from this program as well. Um, so I'd like to thank the London Business School and the Wheeler Institute for this amazing learning opportunity. And also thank you to our um, lovely speaker, Sarah and Giorgio, for giving us such valuable insights into this area. Um, thank you so much to our participants for joining and for contributing very actively. Um, please be rest assured that your questions will be replied and posted during the week. Um, so thank you also to our moderator, um, Elias. I'm actually going to pass the mic to you now to close the session. Thank you very much. Dear Amanda, thank you very much for hosting the session. Dear Sarah and dear Giorgio, thanks big time for being with us. Uh, uh, let me also further say that since uh, I'm currently physically now at the London Business School, there was another way to motivate our discussion and uh, not coming from economic history, but coming from what's happening business-wise in the continent nowadays. And we see this old paradigm uh, during the colonial times to resurface. And nowadays, many people talk about the new scramble for Africa, which surprisingly uh, has many similarities uh, to the past. Uh, so uh, uh, some of our, of our guests and friends have flagged this and I wanted to, to, to share this view. Now tomorrow we will have our main session, uh, which didn't happen on Tuesday because our great colleague and friend, Leonard Vanchekun will deliver the Simon Kuznets lecture at Yale University. Uh, his session will start at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern US time, which is nine o'clock London time. So it has to be a bit later. Let me say that we are all very happy uh, that uh, Leonard's work uh, in this area has been recognized uh, by the economics department of Yale University and the, who they have asked uh, Leonard to deliver this, uh, this lecture. So hopefully many of you will have to, uh, will want to attend this. You will have to register through Yale's a growth center, economic growth center for this event. Uh, somehow, you know, we couldn't merge the Zoom links. And um, I guess that's the world we live in today. And next week, uh, we will uh, enter the last uh, kind of week of the main sessions. Uh, on Tuesday, April the 5th, uh, uh, I will take the lead uh, and discuss uh, how we can think about social mobility, opportunity, if you prefer, or intergenerational mobility in education post-independence uh, uh, across African uh, countries, drawing on uh, recent work and parallel work that I've been doing with uh, the late Alberto Alezina, uh, Sebastian Homan, and Stelios. We will also host David Leitin, a professor of political science at Stanford University. David is one of the giants uh, of the field, having done significant contribution in various areas of uh, African political economy. And he will discuss in the very beginning some uh, fascinating work that he has been doing on the role of colonial languages and the, and the languages of the curriculum in shaping a uh, political and economic uh, outcomes uh, across Africa post-independence. Then on Wednesday, April the 6th, uh, we will start uh, with our three plenary sessions. So we'll have our first plenary session with uh, Bill Easterly, uh, who I guess doesn't need much introduction, a professor of economics at uh, New York University, uh, who have done very important work on foreign aid and African development, Celestine Monga, a professor at the, the Kennedy School at Harvard and MIT Sloan, former chief economist of the African Development Bank, and Dr. Mo Ibrahim, 
uh, who not only has uh, made very successful businesses uh, all across Africa, but he has been pushing a lot through his philanthropic work in improving governance uh, across the continent. So we hope to see you all uh, next week at the main and the plenary session. Uh, we hope that some of you will at least join and attend the Kuznets lecture of uh, Leonard tomorrow. And let me also flag that on Friday, our great teaching fellows uh, will have the special sessions that approximately 500 of you attend. So they are keen uh, to learn more and discuss more on the issues that we have discussed today. Again, uh, thank you all for, for joining us and hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you.